Lord Avebury, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 45th Morris Lubbock Memorial Lecture. Um, when I planned this lecture back in 2018, I thought it would be the first post-Brexit Lubbock lecture. <laughs> but I, I think we should probably rejoice that it isn't yet the first post-Brexit um, lecture. But um, if you talk about the Lubbock lecture, you can't avoid politics because the uh, Lubbock Memorial Trust, which has funded this lecture since the 60s, uh, was set up by Eric Lubbock in memory of his father, Maurice Lubbock, who's an engineer and entrepreneur. Um, and Eric Lubbock won a very famous by-election victory in this country in 1962 that people still talk about. Um, so politics is <coughs> intimately intertwined um, with this lecture. Eric Lubbock was the MP for Orpington in Kent from 62 to 70. He was then elevated to the House of Lords um, with, with a peerage and indeed was a very distinguished Lib Dem spokesman on, on a number of issues uh, throughout the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s. He attended the Lubbock lecture pretty well most of the time. It really had to be a major excuse, like a three-line whip in the House of Lords to keep him away. Um, uh, and um, uh, I believe that uh, he attended the first Lubbock lecture when I was head of department back in 2015. Um, but sadly uh, passed away in February 2016. And we have uh, today's Lord Lubbock, his son, uh, uh, Lyof, who is um, going to be uh, proposing a vote of thanks uh, at the end of the lecture. The lecture will last about 45, 50 minutes or so, and then there'll be a time for question before the vote of thanks. And as I say, because we were planning um, our first post-Brexit um, Lubbock lecture, we wanted to make a statement that regardless of what happens with Brexit or whether Brexit happens or not, um, we will continue to work with Europe. And I'm sure everybody would agree with that. And of course, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, <laughs> but I think it is generally shared by, by the rest of the department. And so I didn't need to look further than the city of my birth, Paris, because there are a number of engineering schools in Paris. Most of you will know them. Um, I'm not going to say which one is, is the most famous one because I don't want to upset our guests. But <laughs> um, the answer is easy. Uh, it's l'école des ponts. Um, everybody in France knows it because it is actually the oldest engineering institution in the world. It's back to the mid 18th century. Um, and it is one of the top three engineering schools um, educating the engineers of tomorrow in France, and indeed, not just the engineers to most in France, because it attracts from people from all sorts um, of uh, parts of the world, not just French-speaking, uh, but often the English-speaking world as well. Because every institution, just like our department, these days is a global institution. But uh, because they have this great tradition, and because the theme is civil engineering this year for the Lubbock Day, um, there is no better place to go in Europe than l'école des ponts et chaussées, ENPC, for short if you want. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome, um, in fact, we're going to get two for the price of one in terms of the um, Lubbock lecture. We're going to get um, the director in French, but probably it's, we, we've discussed this over dinner last night. It's very hard for titles to translate. You could choose dean, you could choose president, you could choose chief executive of the school. Um, we've settled on president, and so I am delighted. Um, Antoine Picon, a professor at the uh, ENPC, will, will come on a little bit later. But I'm delighted to be able to uh, welcome this year's uh, 45th Maurice Lubbock Memorial Lecture, Madame Sophie Migard. Muga, the uh, president of ENPC. So, dear Lord Avery, dear Lionel, ladies and gentlemen, well, first of all, thank you for this kind invitation. It's a great honor and it's a great pleasure to be here today to give this lecture. And because, uh, firstly, we had a great opportunity yesterday and today also to meet with some colleagues and discuss about what is the role of engineers, the evolution of our schools, so it's really important and uh, rich to exchange point of view on that. 
And secondly, because Antoine Picon, Professor Picon, accepted to join me and give us some perspective on history on, on those subjects. Before I give the floor to Antoine, let me just share with you some key facts and figures on the school to show you where we are, who we are and where we are talking from. So uh, Lionel said it, top uh, three French grand école, which is the oldest one in engineering. And we are, which is special, affiliated to the Ministry for Inclusive and Ecological Transition. We have about 2,000 students, and as you can see, half of them in the engineering, and uh, 550 postdoc and PhD students in our 12 labs. And we have uh, 500 executive education students at a time. Our faculty is 1,200 uh, people coming from academics, affiliated professors, but they also are professionals, for some of them, who come to teach at in our school. So, um, before, before going on on the issue, the strategy of the school, I give floor to Antoine, who will uh, give us a perspective of history of our school and history about engineering globally. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all for having me today with Sophie. So perhaps a uh, short precision, I'm an engineer who turned badly. I became an historian. Uh, <laughs> So what I'm going to do is a little bit of history of engineering, insisting on the fact that engineering has changed a lot throughout its history. And I'm going to try to present a kind of periodization uh, with the idea that there were three major engineering revolutions that we inherited from. I will try also to position the Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées, the School of Bridges and Highway, within this historic frame, and then conclude by a few remarks on the challenges of the present. One of the thread, the thread in what Sophie and I have prepared is really that, you know, we are in a challenging period in which a lot of things we knew about engineering, engineering education, etc., is uh, greatly challenged by technological but also social evolution. So this is really the thread we're going to follow and I'm going to try to remain and I'm going to remain within my 20 minutes. So. Let me start by this idea that engineering has always been about change and surprise, surprise, because it is about change, it has been marked by a number of revolutions. So if we limit ourselves simply to the Western uh, tradition, but you know, towards the present, the Western tradition is pretty much what is happening all over the world, I would say there are really three revolutions. The first one is really the emergence of a figure or profile of the engineer at the Renaissance. And then engineering becomes a profession, and this word we'll be talking about the 18th and 19th century. And then the development of engineering science and research, which is mostly 19th, 20th century. So these will be the three uh, moments. Uh, revolution, to use a dramatic, you know, the French love revolution, as we all know. <laughs> so uh, the three revolution I'll be dealing with. So the first one is really the emergence of the engineer at the Renaissance. It is well known that it's at the Renaissance that these pe strange people who call themselves engineers begin to appear. They're still isolated people, I'll come back to that, uh, isolated people, but uh, what they have is the belief that technology is something that has relation to humanities to uh, you know, a more to a more educated uh, kind of uh, knowledge, and at the time, what developed also is a new idea, which is in Italian disegno, which would be translated in English as uh, both de project and design. The engineer, because he's an intellectual, is not somebody uh, like the other working people, uh, is supposed to conceive project in his head, and design is about the way to realize that as a method. So one could say that in many ways Brunelleschi, known as one of the first architects, is also an engineer. The Cupola of Florence is not only a beautiful architectural form, it's also about scaffolding, about machines, etc., etc. With the Renaissance come two big ideas that we will, f that engineering will remain faithful to. The first one is really the idea that there is 
engineering goes with a general curiosity for the world. What's happening in nature, how to harness the power of nature, etc. So something that is almost a kind of encyclopedic. And the second aspect, as if you know, engineering was in a way uh, about writing an encyclopedia of natural forces, etc. And the second idea is invention. The engineer, because he's an intellectual, he's not like the people in the guilds who follow tradition. He's actually inventing new things. <coughs> and probably uh, this is why Leonardo, who is by no means the most remarkable engineer of the Renaissance, has remained as a symbol of this period because he really is both about this encyclopedic curiosity about the world, which includes, by the way, uh, by what we would call today biomechanics and uh, mechanics, etc., and is also about invention, as we all know. So that's my first revolution. Second revolution, 18th, end of the 17th, 18th century, uh, uh, a revolution that actually ignores Brexit, because uh, it's a revolution that happens both in France and in England following different paths, but basically engineers who used to be isolated figures, uh, characters, become members of a larger community, and this is the rise of engineering as a profession. So in France, typically, what we have is our state engineers, <coughs> who are actually working for the government. The first one are fortification engineers at the end of the 17th century. In the 18th century, bridge and highway engineers, uh, which are uh, organized in corp. And with that goes also the rise of modern education with the creation of school. And the school of bridges and highway, the Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées, is actually uh, tr uh, created to train the state engineer responsible for the construction and maintenance of road. Here, an idealized vision of the construction of a road in the 18th century was not so nice, actually. It was a pretty messy process. But nevertheless, uh, that's a little bit the idea. In England, as you know better than I, it's actually association of uh, engineers who begin to have discussion. The first really in 1771, the Society of Civil Engineers with luminaries of the time like Smetton. And later, of course, in 1818, uh, the Institution of Civil Engineers. And with that, a, another model, an alternative model, less school-based, more apprenticeship. Uh, by the way, for a very long time, you know, the French and the British were each trying to exalt their own things and say that they were unique. Actually, they have a lot in common. And one of my arguments is to say that actually France and Britain, at the time, it's part of the same story, the professionalization of the engineer. Um, what else to say? This is going to be, by the way, a messy process because the, one of the problems of engineering is that it tries to become a profession, but it's so diverse that it immediately becomes not one profession, but professions, plural. Third, uh, so that's my second turning point. Engineering becomes a profession or professions, plural. Third one, which may seem natural today, but was not at all seen as natural in the past, the relation between engineering and science. So, which is a more complex process. For example, uh, to there again understand, of course, people like Galileo say that science was supposed to be, uh, have consequences on engineering, but engineers since the 17th century, when they thought what is the nearest discipline, they thought more of architecture, for example, than science. So it's a, pro it's a long process. There again, at the beginning, we find France and England. In France, with a very school-based, again, system, and a, another institution, which, of course, is not as good as the Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées, but the Polytechnic <laughs> School, which is one of the first institutions to have that very bizarre idea to train engineers in direct contact with luminaries of science, like Monge and Lagrange here portrayed uh, on this picture. Uh, in England, people like Fairbairn, Rankin, more applied way to also constitute uh, an, uh, a new relation to science, leading, by the way, to the creation there again of something a bit new, which is the idea of applying uh, science to technology, and that's one of the big ideas of the time. So that's 
Uh, then, sorry for us both on both sides of the channel, the last phase in that revolution, which is the real starting of research as we know it today, is more German and American venture in the second half of the 19th century. And then we have to go, of course, to institutions less distinguished than the Ecole Polytechnique, <laughs> like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to see from the 1860s onwards, uh, you know, the development of what we call today research with lab labs with chairs and all the system we're accustomed to. And then from Germany and uh, the United States, the model will diffuse. So where do we stand as the Ecole des Posées Chaussée in this whole story? This is a little bit as an introduction to what Sophie wants to present. Where do we stand? Where does the school fit in this story? Yeah, just the last thing perhaps to mention, which is not without importance for an institution like the Ecole des Pots, which is the relation to science actually is also what will lead to the managerial revolution in engineering. The idea that engineering is not only about applying the laws of nature, it's also about human organization. And Frederick Winslow Taylor and scientific management is clearly perceived at the beginning as an application of science. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, the success of Frederick Winslow Taylor is that he is actually claiming the objectivity of science, etc. I'm saying it's not without importance in the Ecole des Pots. The most distinguished school of engineering in France train as many managers as they do engineers. So that sometimes we're wondering, are we a little business school? Are we an engineering school? It's part of the complexity of these institutions. So to make a long story short, where does my uh, Ecole des Pots fit into this three-tiered evolution? So very clearly, the Ecole des Ponts is part of the professionalization movement. It is created actually to train engineers for a career in the state, for the state, to create state engineers. By the middle of the 19th century, the institution changes and it begins to train also engineers for the private sector. Long story, very complex story. Uh, it does also imply this kind of school <coughs> revolution in engineering. That's to say you have to sit on benches to learn engineering, which is still a bizarre idea. By the way, we still have the statue of the founder of the Ecole, uh, who is here on this drawing of the first half of the 19th century. So this is very clearly part of that. With professionalization, something I did not mention, uh, which is quite important, is the idea that the engineer is no longer a guy who is doing one isolated project. It's about global progress. It's about welfare, etc. And this is a very strong theme. One of the consequences is that engineering is no longer seen as you know, crafting a masterpiece like architect or whatever. It's about actually uh, contributing to a global process with the idea that there is a coherence. It's leading somewhere. At the Ecole des Ponts, this is probably one of the institutions in which this belief has been led to its more uh, uh, evident consequences. The school trained people to plan for the entire nation. And the dream of the engineer was actually to really master all the sciences, disciplines, etc., that contributed to it. So this is an imaginary representation of the Ecole des Ponts in the late 18th century. So let me reassure you, the Ecole did not look like that. <laughs> but it's actually meant to present the Ecole as a kind of academy in which you cultivate all kinds of science. For example, if we look at the detail on the left, where you can see that engineering is about scholarship, but it's also about design, and you have students unfolding a uh, drawing of a bridge. It's about science, and you have stu students checking that sound does not propagate in vacuum, etc. So harnessing all that. For which purpose? Actually planning the entire territory as if it was a kind of giant garden. And around the same time, the students are asked actually, uh, this is actually part of learning how to draw maps. But the drawing of maps transforms itself in this kind of academic setting into this crazy exercise in which you draw an ideal map of an ideal country in which you find all kinds of civil engineering work, bridges, dams, harbors, etc., all that to, to bring to perfection the national, uh, the, the national territory. Another map with the founder of the school in the medallion, it helped to get, get a good grade at the time, uh, but with the same kind of idea. 
In the bridges and the highway, one of the things the school trained a lot of civil engineers, it trained also a number of people who actually planned a lot of things in France. Among the things, for example, they planned, Osmanian Paris is to a large extent the work of alumni of the Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées. For example, the water and sewer system is by Belgrand, who is one of the alumni of the school. And something less known, but actually all the plantation parks, etc., in Paris were actually coordinated by engineers. And if you go one day at the Butte Chaumont in Paris, it's a, it's a garden which is entirely designed by an engineer, which explains why you have so many bridges in it. <laughs> uh, if you see, there are all kinds of bridges, suspension, um, uh, iron bridge, there, concrete bridge, etc., etc. So this is this tradition that the Ecole des Ponts encompassed and that went well into the 20th century, but that would be much too long to explain. In the couple of minutes uh, I have before, you know, t leading, uh, leaving the floor to our main speaker, I'd like just to wrap up by suggesting that what's happening today might very well be a kind of crisis of all this rich history we inherited as engineers, a kind of crisis linked to a number of factors. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention, yes, the last thing, of course, the Ecole des Ponts was also absolutely present in the unfolding of engineering science. You know, the 1826 uh, lectures on the application of mechanics to construction of Navier, of the Navier-Stokes, uh, uh, was actually a bestseller at its time in engineering. It was actually translated in, in English very quickly by the, the dean of West Point and was used as the, the basis of the instruction of the Army Corps of Engineers at West Point. So there again, you know, names like Navier, Coriolis, Saint-Venant, Bresse, and many others for those, uh, uh, you know, are very emblematic of that. So where do I want to go? We might very well be at a new turning point in engineering, <coughs> engineering evolution, and this is a big challenge for us. Turning point for what reason? Uh, actually, the unraveling or a kind of evolution of a number of things. For example, take the relation to science. Science used to be applied to technology, and the engineer was the person in charge of application. But today you have more and more scientists in material science, etc., who actually apply directly. So what about engineers? How do they redefine their role? Of course, it has relation with all kinds of technological evolution you're very well aware of, like the digital, etc., etc. But this is a question. Take the profession. The engineer used to think that progress was a good thing. Today you have many people in many countries, developed countries, who say, you know, technological progress, no good. So what do engineers do? So it means that actually the engineer is no longer this kind of social hero who is doing all things for the better, and which means that, you know, this kind, you know, this is well embodied at the time, by the way, was pretty much an old male uh, profession. And, you know, we may have to invent another figure of engineer that this kind of super uh, hero that engineering fed upon for many centuries. And this is probably the challenge of contrary engineering education. And on this very brief note, I'm very happy, very glad to uh, give the podium to Sophie, who will explain what we do at the Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine, for this travel in history. So I, th I think, I hope it gave you a, a better understanding of where we are coming from. And uh, as, as a, the oldest engineering school uh, institution in France. Indeed, uh, in uh, 2017, when I had the honor to be appointed as the president of the Ecole Nationale des Ponts et Chaussées, the school was commemorating its 270th anniversary. Only a very few engineering schools, you know, in the world could celebrate such a longevity yet. Yet you will agree that for institutions, I don't talk about people, but for our institutions, our anniversaries only have value if they are bridges toward the future. So therefore, my mandate couldn't be only a long remembrance of our history, of our long tradition of excellence. Nor could it be uh, a mere contemplation of the display masterpieces 
that were designed by engineers of Ponzi Chaussée throughout the years. So uh, here are some, they are really nice. But my mandate would only have value if we manage collectively to cast a new light on our heritage, a light of modernity. And if today, as we have done since 1747, we collaborate to better bridge the gaps of our societies and open roads towards new worlds. So this is the very vocation of our school as enshrined in this same Pont des Chaussées, bridges and highways, bridges and roads. So here are some shareable experiences of the journey the school has been undertaking to remain faithful both to its tradition of excellence and to its vocation to train all-round engineers of today and tomorrow. This journey started by listening to the cause of our time. On such a matter, it is a common understanding that we are in troubled times, with many changing features and worrying changes, many problems that need to be solved. However, we usually say engineers are problem solvers, but Peter Drucker, which is a notable strategist, invites us to go forward not only think in terms of problem solving, but also to analyze our situations in terms of opportunities to better train our students. Thus, the first opportunity of our school to transform is the fight against climate change and for the ecological transition. Climate change, Acidification of the oceans, global sea level rise, desertification, water scarcity, loss of biodiversity, air, water and soil pollutions, rising urban demography, 70% of the population, the world population will be concentrated in cities by 2050. All this has a direct impact on our societies and our role as engineers. In this context, we have been more and more challenged by our corporate partners and stakeholders on how to turn knowledge into concrete solutions for tomorrow. In particular, in the field of civil engineering, we are asked to deliver solutions to attenuate and adapt to climate change, be it storage and capture of CO2, development of more resilient and resistant materials, experimenting new forms of material recycling and reusing. And many companies have understood that environmental innovations are will lead to significant competitive advantages. Moreover, expertise in analyzing and understanding the global impact on the environment, on soil, on biodiversity is also demanded along with prospective and predictive evaluations and scenery regarding extreme phenomena caused by climate change and environmental erosion. Therefore, environmental erosion urges our engineers to address the issue of resilient cities, sustainable production and infrastructure. Many, many unexpected disruptions are read of us, be it in artificial intelligence or in automation. As a matter of fact, digital is already revolutioning the way engineers work, from cobots to augmented intelligence. In addition, new ways of building have been explored, for instance, parametric conception or numerical conception, where robotization in construction field promises the increase of productivity that other industrial sectors have witnessed for the last 50 years. Digital is also reshaping the job market. Workers need to be good at complex problem solving, teamwork and adaptability, states this year report of the World Bank. So this change raises social concerns on the future of work of vulnerable people. Moreover, 
ethical issues are emerging, in particular on the explainability of algorithm and on the amplification of inequalities due to biased databases. Therefore, our engineers will have both to be skilled to adapt to the new demand of job markets, to seize the new opportunity technology is offering, and be to be training on managing sensitive ethical matters. <coughs> Raising inequalities from economic inequalities to inequalities to access to public services are having severe consequences on a nation, on a state economy, and cohesion. Inequalities urge us to better understand and analyze risk, constraint, and social, environmental, and economic <coughs> impacts in order to better arbitrate when it comes to urbanism, mobility, <coughs> and more broadly, public policies. And science is more than ever called to intervene on political issues. We saw it on climate change with the EPCC or on biodiversity with the EPBES. Science must be the baseline on which public policies are built, as a G7 communique this year states. Thus, as schools, we need to teach and inspire our students to take on their engineer social responsibility in their activities. Science and society, yet at the same time, let us acknowledge the emergence of an opposing voice. This voice can be called um, Earth is flat. <laughs> curcuma, curcuma is the best cure for cancer. Or the whole climate crisis is not only fake news, it's fake science. Maybe some of you recognize this last post. This last tweet, more than 100,000 likes on this post. And many other alarming polls and popular definitive phrases could be quoted. Doesn't this illustrate a trend where well-established and robust scien scientific findings are questioned, are leveled down, and considered as mere belief? This is the reason why it has become more and more crucial that our scientists and engineers be trained to be active actors and communicators in this necessary dialogue between science and society, between scientists and all other members of society, politicians, business leaders, citizens, in particular, our youth. So one explanatory factor for science being questioned is probably its increasing complexity and nuances are in a time when the general attention today of most millennials is being downgraded to nine seconds, one second more than a golden fish. <laughs> well, I do believe uh, that Bruno Patino, which is head of Sciences Po School of Journalism, computed this surprising figure without any data of Oxford or Ecole des Ponts <laughs> attention, students' attention, of course. Yet, our economic system based on emotions, which come first ahead of critical thinking, amplifies the rejection of complexity and rather leads to simplistic judgments. How can we deal with complexity in 140 characters? <laughs> and we all know that simplicism is only another name of populism. Thus, there is an opportunity to form young women and men who won't dwell into simplicism, but be comfortable in a more and more complex environment that will involve an increasing number of stakeholders, of contractual injunctions, incomplete, imperfect, or biased informations, and underlying ethical issues. Last but not least, and maybe it is the most pressing urge on opportunity to transform our pedagogy, our students' quest of meaning. Ponce-et-Chaussée, and I know Oxford too, have well noticed student concerns 
on the environment. In February, more than 30,000 students of Grandes Ecoles in France signed the Manifesto for an Ecological Awakening. Among those students, many of ours. This manifesto expi explicitly stated the uneasiness of the youth, confronted to daily contradictions between economic system assumptions, submissions and their values. They are demanding that an environmental and social ambition be included in their daily life. Other manifestos are explicitly calling for citizen disobedience, with many students expressing their despair and their loss of meaning. We, as a school that by essence is highly engaged in sustainable development, we have a fantastic opportunity to innovate, to find the best pedagogic way to bring our students on board and let them be inspired by our school core values and indeed vocation. Thus, we saw six key challenges and opportunities, an environment to repair and care for, a digital revolution to, take or to tackle properly so that it is fully seized and leaves no one behind, rising inequalities and social injustices within and between countries to be curbed, the dialogue between science and society to restore, an era of complexity to embrace without simplicism and a quest of meaning for our students to support and inspire. So how do we intend to seize them all? What are our school strategy? Well, Anatole France enlights us in an elegant way. Strategy essentially consists of crossing rivers on bridges and mountains on roads. Here again, bridges and roads, Pont des Chaussées, since 1747. So our strategy at Pont des Chaussées consists in developing both the strategic fields of expertise we want to train our students in, and let me spin the metaphor, let's call them our main avenues of education, and the skills we want them to acquire, which could be the bridges across the mountains. Both bridges and roads are necessary, that's why we chose for a savvy equilibrium between training our engineers by skills and allowing them to acquire the core knowledge required from the socio-eco world. So with our 12 laboratories, we have defined four pillars, <coughs> which will be the generalist avenues of knowledge of our school. We were part particularly attached to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, and with, uh, by our high quality curriculum focusing on the four pillars displayed on the screen, we train our students and our executive professionals to have direct impact on seven of those 17 sustainable development goals and indirectly of all of them. <coughs> so those four pillars are both expertise domains for our research and opportunities for our society and for our partners also. Urban systems on mobility, meaning development of resilient and sustainable cities and of smart mobilities. Resources, environment and risk management dealing with interdisciplinary assessment of meteorological, climate, energy, and financial risks. Industry of the future, aiming at the convergence of the ecological and digital transitions to increase efficiency and achieve sustainability of production. And finally, economy, behavior, and society revolving around the design and the evaluation of public and corporate policies economically, socially, and environmentally. Yet, those four pillars don't define for silo disciplines. On the contrary, they help to bring flexibility, synergies through interdisciplinary so that our students could compose more customized generalist curricula. For instance, we mainstreamed in every track for our students digital courses such as analysis of data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence so that every engineer we could seize the opportunities the, the digital revolution brings its, to its subject of majors. So surely our students are armed with rigorous knowledge, yet referring to the six opportunities we discussed earlier, our engineers need to develop robust competencies. And François Taddy, one of our alumni 
involved in innovation and learning states in an OECD report, today everybody needs to learn how to learn, how to cooperate and how to use all the knowledge made available by new technologies. So this is kind of a paradigm shift from a student acquiring specific knowledge of hard engineering to a, an all-round engineer learning how to learn and to adapt continuously. This is crystallized by the notion of competency-based education. And we have Jacques Tardif, a researcher at Sherbrooke, who applies the concept of cognitivism in the education field. He has been helping our school in a pedagogy transition whose impact is currently under scientific assessment. Indeed, the whole school was mobilized from directors of programs to teachers to define the five displayed skills that we aim to develop in our students. In other terms, engineers of pont et chaussee are scientists, meaning rigorous, autonomous, and methodological. Ingenious, meaning creative and agile, in order to innovate, to meet social, societal needs, and respond to unprecedented situations. Responsible toward the society they will serve, that is to say, be able to quantify the risks in uncertain contexts, host holistically assess the implication of their actions, arbitrate in complexity, and to assume their sphere of responsibility. They must also be rich of their openness to interculturality, capable of navigating in a heterogeneous, pluridisciplinary, international, and multi stakeholder environment, and effective communicants. They must be able to prove relational skills, to create team commitments, to manage women and men in a common purpose, to participate positively in the public debate. So <coughs> thus, our pedagogy aims at training project engineers, innovating engineers, managing engineers, and last but not least, citizen engineers. So four in one, how come? Well, firstly, project engineer. We implemented a becoming by doing multidisciplinary approach based on projects. We become engineer by being an engineer. Internships are, of course, a privileged pedagogic format to put students in practical situations. We believe Pont des Chaussées couldn't be a school of theory, only a school of theory. Therefore, we worked hard to put students in genuine contextualized and not so smooth situations, such as what we call the Pontian projects. Those interdisciplinary projects involve students from different majors altogether in a highly complex and strategic question, issue, problems submitted by a firm, by a company, and supervised by a researcher. On the one hand, the strong link between our school and its socio-economic partners make a pedagogic innovation possible. And on the other hand, being supported by our laboratories, our researchers, makes possible to machine with highly sophisticated equipments and tools from our makerspace. Secondly, innovate, innovating engineers. To help our students be the innovators of today, of tomorrow, we have opened the possibility for them to work on their projects while <coughs> studying. This includes a rearrangement of their tracks so that their schedule leaves them time to mature their projects and so that the experiences they accumulate and their successes be rewarded by credits. As a school, we are also hosting entrepreneurial projects within our Green Tech Incubator and in Station F, where we are partner of. Besides, through a partnership with the D School of Stanford, we have been teaching our students the methodology of design thinking, which is based on a people-centric approach. This implies observing closely how people use objects and the functionality they really demand, and getting involved in an iterative co-construction <coughs> with the final consumers, so that innovation matches the most the clients, the clients' needs. 
Thirdly, manager di managing engineers. To raise our students' understanding of the professional structures they will join, and to help them communicate more efficiently, we develop, on the one hand, an offer of courses on accounting and business law and on sociology of organizations. Those modules help our students better understand the constraint of their work environment, the framework their business partners will fit in, and make them be able to be aware of topics such as power struggle, hierarchical command chain, inertia to action, reluctance to change, and other similar phenomena you probably met. On the other hand, the school has developed a myriad of courses to help students develop their communication skills. A module specifically tackling the notions of scientific controversy. For instance, we had some nice ones in France with Notre Dame des Landes, which was supposed to be a new airport built, but a highly political and social issue where technical solutions didn't receive social acceptance. So they are, our students are encouraged to take theatre modules, debating courses, and expression classes. Finally, citizen engineer. As engineers, it's, it's, uh, it's essential that they acquire ability of critical <coughs> distance, reflection on the role of engineers in society, and finally, on their own responsibility. As an example, we train them to broaden the scope of their analysis through the dedication to sustainable development. We teach them the concept of life cycle assessments, methodologies of analysis of costs and benefits, assessing social and environmental externalities, and intergenerational arbitrage. Yet, humans often know what they do, but they never know what does what they do, affirms Paul Valéry. That's why we highly support the charitable and citizen work carried out by our students. It gives them a foothold in the concrete reality and meet different stakeholders their action would impact. It is also a way for them to engage in societal, in social, societal questions like they did last week during a youth citizen consultation for the G7 summit against inequalities. So we have traveled together throughout history, throughout pedagogy, and most importantly, throughout society. We have identified six opportunities for us at schools to train better our students. We are engaged into a transformative process, both to remain faithful to our tradition of excellence and scientific expertise, and to rise the call of our world, of our youth. I think our students belong to probably the first generation who is conscious of the urge of sustainable development. They are indeed demanding a more sustainable society, a more human-centered economy, and a more purposeful science. And they are probably the last one, the last generation, to be able to do something about it. Either we face this reality with fear, be paralyzed by it, and let our students be overwhelmed by it, or we help them. We help them seize this opportunity to innovate, and we shoulder them the very identity of engineer. Our job is crucial, and yet more, I would say vital. We are in charge of supporting them. That's why we work hard, creatively, and in hand with and for our students, for our society, and for our world. Thank you very much. <laughs>